good afternoon everyone uh, thank you so much all of those who have joined us on youtube and a special thank you to all uh, the speakers who consented to be here so today uh, as a part of the century uh, the completion of 100 years of the university so we, uh, the, the university of lucknow is in its centenary year and the Department of Zoology University of Lucknow will enter into its centenary year from July 16th, so consider it as a pre-program. So on these two auspicious occasions, on the merging of these two auspicious occasions, uh, the Department of Zoology uh, decided, uh, the initiative led by uh, Dr. Kalpana Singh, oh, we decided to conduct a webinar on a topic which is much less discussed uh, in the zoological field in India, and elsewhere too, especially in India, it's a much negated, a much neglected field, and which is forensic science of forensic biology, and especially forensic entomology. So uh, because of this, we have decided to introduce a new topic to discuss, a new kind of uh, subject to pick up. And for this, we decided to do an international webinar on forensic entomology and its relevance in legal proceedings. As all the listeners are well aware, uh, this will be spread over two days. We will be conducting it from 2 to 4.30 today and from 2.30 to 4.30 and we expect you all to join. We have some fabulous speakers lined up. So today we have uh, Dr. Devinder Singh, uh, who will be introduced later, who is an expert, probably uh, the expert of forensic entomology in India. And uh, we will be having Dr. Mark Benick, who is a forensic consultant of great fame uh, across the world uh, and has done really uh, interesting cases and we'll be talking about that when it's time to introduce him. Before we start with the seminar, um, let me first thank you all uh, because the audience is essential for any webinar or any kind of uh, exchange of knowledge and uh, because we are from Lucknow, so let me just say, Bin Hasti Koi Mehfir Kesi. Bin Divano Shame Avad Kesi. Ham sab to bas kadadan hai. Irunke Divane hai. Or Bin Divano Shame Avad Kesi. So, aye, Huzur Milkar, yes, Sham Rang de, ki shat se pehli hi sitare didar de de. So, let us initiate this. And to begin with, I would request uh, our head of department, uh, Dr. Subhir Pavar to uh, please uh, speak a few words about the uh, event and how we are going to start and what this entire talk consists about. Professor Sudhir Kumar? I think there are some connectivity issues. Uh, therefore, I'll ask uh, Professor Omkar Professor Umkar is the senior entomologist of our department. He is also, uh, he has the great honor of being an FNASC, which is Fellow of National Academy uh, of uh, Sciences India, Allahabad, which is the oldest science academy. He has spent his entire life working on uh, ladybird biology. He is well renowned across the world for his uh, uh, contributions to the field of entomology. He has published many international books in the field of entomology. Uh, he, is, uh, he has been awarded the Saraswati Samman, which is the highest award in, uh, for a teacher in, uh, in higher education and the state of UP. I request him to please uh, say a few words to introduce the subject, the webinar, and this first speaker of the day, Professor Devinder Singh. Professor Romkar, I hand over the uh, scene to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gitanjali Mishra, nominated speakers, and dear participants. Uh, a very outset, I extend my Great uh, welcome to the learned speaker and my friend Dr. Devan Singh, 
and to the participants of this webinar. Webinar is the term on which uh, I am facing for the first time, and today I am speaking in the first uh, for the first time in such gatherings. At the very outset, I take this opportunity to welcome you all on this two-day international webinar on forensic entomology and its relevance uh, in legal proceedings. Our department is a very old department of zoology, one of the oldest schools of zoology. It, it was established for the first time in the year 1921 after the bifurcation of the then Department of Biology uh, of the then Canning College, which later turned into Lucknow University. So in Canning College, there used to be Department of Biology, which was bifurcated at the establishment of Lucknow University into two departments, Zoology and Botany departments. Dr. G.S. Thapar became first officiating head of the department and he was soon followed by Professor K. M. Bhal, who was a giant, uh, giant geologist of the country of that time. And uh, the products of this department, they have spread to so many uh, institutions and universities and they established the Department of Geology there, like University of Delhi, like University of Madras, and at other places. This department has, in fact, uh, given five vice chancellors to different universities. And this is uh, not only one of the oldest departments, this is uh, one of the biggest departments in uh, science faculty, you can say. In here, probably you might be knowing, here in the University of Lucknow, we have UG and PG teaching uh, along with the research that is PhD program. So we have here about uh, 750 UG students along with 100 PG students and some 80 to 100 PhD and postdoc research students are there in this department. And I'm happy to say that uh, this department is open even on Sundays and other holidays because most of the research students, they visit the department uh, pertaining to their research programs. I at present in the department, we have eight professors two associate professors and seven assistant professors. Besides these, uh, nine positions are vacant. So in all, the overall faculty strength of the department is 24. And uh, the teachers, our uh, previous heads, they were all fellow of National Academy of India. At that time, INSA was termed as National Indian National Academy and the fellowship was termed by FNI. So we have uh, three, four uh, FNIs from this department. Uh, and this department initially there used to be only classical geology that is uh, invertebrate and vertebrate geology. So one year invertebrate geology was taught at PG level and another year started geology was taught at uh, some time in 1960s, early 60s, specializations were started in our PG curricula and uh, initially two specializations were there that is on helminthology and entomology and then at some later stage the helminthology was renamed as uh, parasitology and entomology. Then in early 70s, another specialization, fish and fisheries was added in our PG courses. And uh, recently, after 2000, we have introduced another fourth specialization that is reproductive biology and you know, endocrinology. This department is uh, well recognized and even uh, in the present faculty, Three of the teachers of the department, they have been awarded by the Department of Higher Education, Government of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, one is Saraswati Samma to a teacher and the two more teachers are awarded with Sri uh, Award. So in this way, not only this, the department is funded by 
UGC SAP program, GST fees program, GST PERS program, Center of Excellence, sanctioned by Department of Higher Education, Government of UP. Initially, only one center was sanctioned. Now there are several such smaller programs sanctioned by Department of Higher Education. So in addition to four specialization, the department has also given to the university two research institutes. One is Institute of Wildlife Sciences that is looked after by some of the faculty of the department and then Institute for Advanced Research in Molecular Genetics and Infectious Diseases. This is in process. So in this way, this is well known and renowned department uh, of the country and uh, the persons and the products, they are highly uh, and well placed throughout the country in different fields. Even my PhD students, they are placed maybe BHU, some other central university. So the students uh, are mostly PhD students, they are well placed. So uh, I am really very happy to declare this two-day international webinar open. And uh, the basic theme of this two-day seminar is supposed to be to popularize forensic entomology to disseminate and update knowledge about forensic fauna of India, to update knowledge to participants about the role of biological, animal, and insect evidence in legal proceedings. Forensic entomology to make aware the forensic entomology and its role, which is it, it has in the uh, resolving the legal disputes and uh, uncovering the criminal cases. So these four are the basic objectives of this webinar. So I am really very happy that this is being open today and all participants will listen to learned speakers and they will be benefit. Fulfilled. I'm very happy that uh, to say that the learned speaker, the first speaker of this webinar is Professor Devinder Singh. He is a former head department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences, Punjabi University Patiala. He is basically product of Punjabi University Patiala, the same department. He topped the 1982 batch. Uh, that is why he is a recipient of MSc gold medal of that institution. And in 1984, he was awarded a MPhil degree. In 86, 1986, he was awarded a PhD degree. Later, he moved to University of Illinois at Chicago for his postdoctoral fellowship. And he learned there on the basic techniques of forensic entomology with the leading expert, Professor Bernard Greenberg. So I am happy to have Professor Devinder Singh here in this webinar. Professor Devinder Singh has enormous contribution. He is a member of several academic uh, bodies, academies and societies. He has published about 200 research papers, edited one book, completed some eight research projects, contributed four chapters in different books. Professor Devinder Singh has supervised 28 PhD students along with eight MPhil students. Besides this, he, he has published so many uh, popular articles in Indian books. And you, you can say that he is a living legend of forensic entomology in India. So I'm very happy to welcome my friend and a contemporary colleague, Professor Devinder Singh, uh, for this webinar to start his lecture. I would request uh, Professor Devinder Singh to kindly start his talk. Professor Devinder Singh, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, so uh, we would we are waiting very eagerly to hear you. Uh, so the stage is yours, sir. As in when you are. Oh. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, 
good evening everybody uh, first of all i am thankful to i am audible uh, yes sir so if, if you you could switch on your uh, video sir it would be we would be able to see you yeah i have switched on okay right so yes sir yes sir yes sir. on the onset i am thankful to dr omkar and dr kalpana for inviting me to this webinar and hence participate in the uh, centenary celebrations of this great university uh, should i start with the, uh, the sharing the screen uh, absolutely sir absolutely so you can present is it there Can you see the slide? Uh, yes, sir. We can, sir. Okay, so today we will discuss about the basics about this uh, science that is, uh, you can say, a budding field uh, as far as India is concerned, but as far as the Gulf countries is concerned, uh, it is a well-established field in most of the Western countries of the world. Uh, I dedicate this lecture to Professor Bernard Greenberg, uh, my mentor. I learned uh, basics of forensic anthropology from him in his lab at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I was there uh, from 92 to 93, and uh, Greenberg was uh, 70 years old at that time, and he was, uh, I must admit, more active than me. I was uh, just 32. So he has been a candlelight, and he is uh, today called the uh, father of modern forensic entomology in the world. So he died in uh, 2017. So I pay my respect to him in, in this uh, webinar. So I believe uh, most of these students are from zoology, but still there will be some who are not zoologists or entomologists or for that matter, who are not even biologists. So uh, entomology, as we understand, is a study of insects. Insects, as you, you know, they are six like creatures and uh, about 70% of total species, they are insects. 1.3 million described species of insects are there and uh, they have been dominating this world and even today, they are dominating almost all the niches and they are the most efficient uh, adapters to any ecosystem in the world. So basically, uh, the body of the insect is divided into three parts, head, thorax, and abdomen, and one pair of legs is attached to each of these parts. And the majority of the insects, they have got two pairs of wings. Of course, some are wingless or some maybe have only a single pair of wings. A characteristic feature of insects is uh, metamorphosis. That is, uh, when the young ones are born, they are not born in the same form as the adults are, and gradually they change to the adult stage. This is uh, a feature very unique to insects, and this is a feature which forms our basis of uh, forensic metamorphology as we see uh, later on. And metamorphosis further is the uh, we divide it into two categories, incomplete metamorphosis, as we see in the case of a cockroach, where the young ones which are born, they are just like adults, except that they don't have wings and they don't have the gonads, uh, and uh, they just go into the adult stage. But uh, more prominent and more interesting is complete metamorphosis, when the young ones are born in a stage which is completely different from the adults. And this is a strategy to avoid competition with the adults that the young ones, they will be feeding from something else and adults will be feeding from uh, some different type of food. So most of the advanced insects, they are having complete metamorphosis and uh, those insects which we will be discussing during uh, forensic etymology, uh, which are important, so they are having complete metamorphosis in them. So with this background, we start with our talk about uh, 
our today's uh, discussion, it is the uh, forensic entomology, how it is important. So as you can say, uh, anybody can understand, forensic means uh, investigation of crime, entomology is study of insects. So the role of insects in investigation of crime becomes forensic entomology. Before we start with the, our here talk, uh, I'll like to have some background about the subject. Uh, these photographs that you will see in the background, this was work of one of my uh, students who was doing the uh, MD in forensic medicine. He did uh, work on rotting dead bodies, so they not be some of these photographs may not be good to look at. But the uh, forensic entomologists they should be adapted to this type of. So when any animal dies, if it remains unattended, the dead body remains unattended, then it passes through these stages, which we call as a press stage, bloater stage, decay stage, and dry stage. And this will happen to the dead body of any animal, including that of man, if the body remains unattended, we don't disturb it. But to most of the time, because of ethical reasons, because of religious reasons, because of social customs, uh, human bodies are not allowed to decay like that. And it is only under exceptional circumstances that the human body decay and they pass through these four development uh, decay stages. Experimentally, when we have to study the decay of dead bodies, we cannot use humans. So most of these studies to understand the composition of dead bodies has been done on the pigs. So this is just a, a sequence of events that is taking place when the body of a pig is placed in the open and it starts decaying and ultimately at the last stage only bones and cartilage is left and this process is generally temperature related during summer quite quick and during winter the process is slow and it can take much longer time. One thing is clear at this point, that though the body decays through the bacterial action or the action of microorganisms, but here insects play a very important role in the decay process. Without the involvement of insects, the bodies will not decay. Uh, back in 1965, PNA demonstrated that if the body of a pig is kept uh, in a wire mesh so that insects are not allowed to reach the dead body, it will be as fresh even after 100 days. But if the body is allowed, uh, the entry of insects is allowed, then the body decays within 10 15 days. So these insects, they are nature's scavengers, and without their involvement, our earth will be just littered with dead bodies and uh, this uh, feature of the insect that they help in the decay process that is utilized in our science of forensic entomology that we discuss later on. So when a body decays, when a body is there, it will be attracted to a lot of insects. So broadly we classify those insects into four categories. Necrophagous species, these are the species which feed on the flesh. Second category are the parasites and predators, these are those which parasite the first category or predate on the first category. Omnivorous species which play both these roles, they feed on the uh, dead body as well as they feed on the immature stages of the necrophagous species. And fourth is the accidental visitor, which are just there, just by chance, they don't have any role to play. They, they just happen to be there. And these types of insects, they are not very important from forensic point of view. So, so from our purpose, most of the time, the first category, that is necrophagous species, they are important for us because they are the real forensic indicators. So we must differentiate between those insects which are really act, uh, taking part in the decay process and those which are just happen to be there, which are not important from uh, uh, ecological point of view or from forensic point of view. So mainly 
two orders of insects have been reported from dead bodies. Order Coleoptera, the beetles, and second will be Order Diptera, the flies. So all these families of uh, Coleoptera, they have been reported from dead bodies. And uh, uh, these 16 families of Coleoptera, they are known to occur on dead bodies. And uh, most of the time, the beetles are late arrivals. They come late stages. Earlier, the dead bodies are active to the flies. So Diptera is the order which is very attractive to the, uh, which is getting attracted to the dead bodies. And these 18 families of Diptera have been reported from dead bodies, feeding on the dead bodies, or uh, they can be uh, predators or they can be parasites. Out of these, uh, this family one, family Calipharidae, this is the, the most important family from forensic point of view. If I say 95% of the cases in the world where forensic entomology has been utilized for making some revelations, making some evidence, it, uh, it is the Calipharidae family which has been used most of the time. So now question arises, why Calipharids are important from forensic point of view? So you can see these flies, the blue colored flies, the green colored flies, which you see all around on the garbage, on the dead bodies, on the fetal matter, they are the Calipharids. And uh, uh, they will be completing their development on the decaying organic matter. Now, the reason why Calipharids are important from forensic point of view there are some reasons. Number one is that uh, Califorids are truly carrion flies. Califorids don't have any other means of completing their development, completing their life histories than to lay their eggs on the dead body. So the adults, they will get attracted to the dead bodies. Then they will lay their eggs there. Eggs will hatch. And uh, the maggots that come out of the egg, they feed on the flesh and ultimately they complete their development there, pupate there, and adults will be much. So they are truly carrying flies. They will be always found on that body. This is one reason that they are important from forensic point of view. Second is that they are the first to arrive on that body. Experimentally, it has been shown that they will be attracted to the dead body within minutes and in one case, they, they report even seconds. They get attracted to the dead body because of the smell that starts coming once a person dies. The smell starts coming and they get attracted towards it and they arrive even, they arrive on the dead body even faster than the police dogs. So a lot of uh, experiments have been uh, done to prove that if the dead body is there and flies are around, they will get attracted toward the fly within minutes at least. They will not take hours, they will be there within minutes. So this is second feature for us to uh, understand why they are important from forensic point of view. The third point is that they have got predictable life cycle. So a typical fly, a blow fly, Fly. It will lay eggs. From the eggs will emerge the larva. There will be three larval stages, then there will be pupa, and their life cycle is very predictable. And if we know the temperature, we can predict that this larva will be of this size in so many days. This pupa will be formed of so many days. So that once we know the environmental circumstances, particular temperature conditions we can protect their life cycles accurately. And that is a very important from a forensic point of view that we can uh, know their, uh, their life cycle. We can know their age just by determining their size. So on the basis of that, uh, experimentally, we can have a blue flag clock. So just to, it's a hypothetical case that on Day one, activity day. On day two, three, four, five, maggots will be feeding. On the next 
six, seven to up to eleven C. The UP will be there in the soil, and then there will there will be emergence of the adults, and there will be adults within them. And uh, within the pupal stage, we'll be having fresh pupa, uh, cream-colored pupa, light brown pupa, brown pupa, dark brown pupa. In this way, we have got very remarkable identifiable uh, developmental stages of the fly and the canine. They are life cycle is temperature dependent. If I am showing here 15 days, it is at a specific temperature. If the temperature becomes high, life will be shortened, development will be fast. If the temperature is low, development will be slow and uh, their life cycle will be prolonged. And they have got identifiable immature stages. You can identify all their immature stages. First in star, you can identify on the basis of their uh, spiracles. Second in star, again, you can identify on the basis of their interior cycle. Third in star, the pupae, the adults. So their immature stages are very easily identifiable, and that is what we require in a case where insects are used as basic evidence. So these are all the different stages of a typical growth flight from egg to the adult stage. So this is how their life cycle goes on. Uh, here, when the pupa, when the larva is fully grown, it enters a wandering stage, which we call it the post-feeding larva, it stops feeding and starts, uh, uh, they start scattering in the surrounding areas where they will be able to be fed. And then when the pupa is formed, it is white in color, and slowly and slowly it turns into dark brown pupa. And then we have got the emergence of the others. And the pupal shells, they remain on the surface for very long periods of time. And in several cases, pupal shells have been used as expensive evidence. Now, coming to the role, how flow flies are important, what role they play in forensic entomology, we'll be discussing them one by one. Uh, when the police find a dead body, the first thing that they will be able, they will be interested to understand is when the person dies. What is the time of death of that person? That is the first requirement for the police to know uh, when any dead body is found. Second aspect will be whether the person died where the dead body is found at the same place or the person died somewhere else and the body was later on transferred, transported to that area where now it has been. This is the second point where group life help us. We'll discuss it in today. And the third point is, what is the cause of death? So time of death, place of death, and cause of death. These three parameters are important for our investigative agencies. And in all these three aspects, blue flies help us in determining all these three parameters and in providing the uh, uh, evidence during investigation. So first we take up the time of death, how they help in determining the time of death. Uh, when so the police finds a dead body, they will just take it to the hospital where medical practitioners, they will try to determine the time of death. Uh, PMI means post-mortem interval. That is the interval, the period between when the body has been found and the person actually died. So the doctors will determine it on the basis of various pathological parameters. First of all, they will see the temperature of the body. Then they will see the rigor mortis, whether the person is the body is fresh, uh, just fresh, or it is just old body. But no medical practitioner can determine the exact time of death if the body is more than four days old. If the person died more than four days back, so our medical evidence fails to determine the time of death and here our insects they help us determine when the person died. So I mentioned there that uh, insects have got identifiable immature stages and they have got predictable uh, life cycles. So 
So now giving you a hypothetical case, I let you know how they determine the time of death. For example, the police find a dead body today. They take it to the hospital and they on the dead body they also find baggage larvae of the insect of the blow flies. So when those larvae are there, we can determine the age of the larvae on the basis of two parameters. One is uh, their length and second is the temperature. At a particular temperature, how many days are required or how many hours are required for the larva to reach that particular state. For example, if the, the dead body is found today and on that dead body you find maggots which are say 50 hours old. We determine their age, take into consideration the uh, environmental temperature. So if they are 50 hours old, that means the body is at least 50 years old because they have been feeding from the dead body and the person died at least 15, 50 hours back. That we can determine on the, just on the basis of the age of the maggot. I am repeating minimum time in term. It may be more than that. Maybe there was some time that flies could not lay their eggs because of various reasons. But if the maggot is 50 days old, 50 hours old, then it is a must that uh, the body, the person died 50 hours back. So this is one way to determine the uh, time of death in the case of uh, uh, a dead body, when, when a dead body is found. When we determine this time of death, so first of all, we must have correct identification of the maggot. I'm sorry to say that uh, in India, a number of cases have been tried to solve with the help of entomological evidence, but most of the therapists, doctors, they could not, determine, could not identify the species involved because each species has got a specific life cycle. So first thing we have to identify that species and then see its life cycle and then correlate the life cycle with the temperature condition and then determine the age of the maggots and that gives you an estimate of the time of death. As you can see, uh, a graph is given how the maggot size increases and ultimately when uh, it reaches the maximum size, it starts shrinking and it starts decreasing, and the the length of the larvae is dependent on the time interval. So you can directly correlate the time with the length of the time. So in order to determine the age of the maggots, we must have the basic data which regarding the life tables. For example, these are the life. This is, this is the life table for sericata. So at different temperatures, eggs will have different duration, first star, second star, third, all will be having different durations at different temperatures. So for example, if the temperature is 20 degrees, and it takes 22 hours to hatch, 24 hours for the first star to hatch, 35 hours for the second star, plus roughly 26 hours for the third star stage, so if you get the third instar maggot, that means they have already completed under seven hours of development. So that is the minimum time of death. Again, it will depend upon the temperature. If I'm talking about this at 20 degrees centigrade, if you take the data at 30 degrees centigrade, it will be completely So one reason that forensic entomology has not gained uh, popularity in India was data about these flies which has to be generated. Second parameter, second method rather is the insect succession method that the insects they reach the dead body in a particular succession. First will be the blow flies to arrive, then they will be followed by the saprophages, then there will be muskets, then will be other spectrum from this and ultimately we will be having this. For example, trimestrial beetles they will be arriving when the skeletal wounds are there. So if you find uh, uh, 
the nested fetus from a dead body, being dead body, you can well imagine that uh, it is quite an old body, and so many species have already passed and have instead of 20. So as long as uh, it is up to the uh, life cycle of caliprates, the development stage is important. But beyond that, if it is say beyond 20 days, beyond 25 days, then insects helps us to determine how we determine the time of death. So uh, these are just the procedures of the genus. We don't go to get here. So this is one uh, parameter where insects help us to solve crime, that is the time of death. Second is the place of death, where the person died. Whether he died at the same place where the dead body has been found, or he was uh, the, uh, killed or he died somewhere else and the body was shifted at some later stage. So disturbance of the decomposing dead body it disturbs the life cycle of the of the insects as well. So just to put it in a simple way, suppose we find a dead body at place A. And when we study the maggots, when we study the various types of species on that decomposing body, we find that this fauna, these species don't belong to place A. The body is at place A, but the maggots belong to the species which is not uh, reported from that area A, but it is known only from area B. So that means the person died at place B, the flies lays the, laid their eggs on the dead body at place B, and the body was later shifted to place A from B. And now we have found it at place A. That is how we can determine. Similarly, there are some species which are available only indoors. There is one species of flies, Megacilia. They breed only indoors. So if you find a dead body outside in the open with larvae of Megacilia, you can say with certainty that the, part, the person died indoors where megacilia laid their eggs and now we have got body outside because megacilia never lays eggs outdoors. They remain indoors. Similarly, there are species, uh, Califora vicina. Califora vicina is available during the winter in plain. It's commonly called the winter fly. It is available only during winters. But this species is available in the mountains during the summer months because it is cooler there. It cannot tolerate very high temperatures. It's always uh, available during the cooler months during in the plains. And in, during the summer, it is available in the hilly area. So if you find a dead body in June, these days, for example, from the plain with maggots of California or Vicina, Califora vicina should not be available now in the plains because it's too hot. So that is an indication that the body was uh, transported from some area, hilly area, where it's cooler and where this fly is available during the summer months as well. So in this way, we can determine the uh, place of death if the body has been moved to a place by just analyzing the fauna local fauna and by analyzing the fauna that is available on the dead body. Uh, even the movement of the corpse, there are cases when the movement of the corpse was uh, determined uh, from place A to B, from B to C, and so on. There are a number of important cases in future where such information. Third parameter where insects help us in forensic anthropology is the cause of death. So, when the police finds a dead body, they suspect it to be a case of poisoning. They, so, first thing they will do is that they will take some flesh of the dead body, 
and send it to the laboratory for chemical analysis. If that tissue shows the presence of any poison, that means the person died because of that poison, it was uh, taken accidentally or it was taken or whatever may be the reason, but the person died because of that poison. But there are cases when the body is to such a state that no flesh is equal. Only we have got the bones that are there. And bones don't accommodate any poison. Bones cannot be sent to the body. So under such circumstances, again, insects help us. We can send the maggots. Maggots which they are found where the body has been decaying. We can collect the maggots, we can send them to the laboratory, and if they show the presence of any poison, that means the poison in the maggots has come from the dead body upon which they have been feeding, and the person had poison in his body when he died, or it may be the cause of death. So these maggots they can be sent for chemical analysis. So uh, the cause of death and the geographical area is also sometimes determined on the basis of uh, the chemical analysis of maggots. There was a case that uh, a dead body was found in an area which was free from any mercury. The air was free from any mercury. But in the maggots, they found heavy dose of mercury. So that was an indication that the body came from some area where there was high level of mercury in the surroundings. That is why the maggots have got mercury in it. Otherwise, in this area, mercury should be there. So in this way, uh, chemical analysis of maggots, they tell us about the cause of death and sometimes even the geographical area where the person may have died. Experimentally, large number of different types of poisons, they have been detected. Packets. So metals, pesticides, propane, opiates, synthetic opiates, barbiturates, all these different types of chemicals, they have been permanently detected in maggots where these chemicals came from the dead body upon which the maggots have been treated. So this is uh, experimentally established that maggots accumulate the poisons from the dead bodies if the dead body has the most poison. Another very interesting aspect where maggots help us, not only in cases of murder all the time, they help us in uh, detecting uh, the place of origin of the contraband or illegal drug traffic. So most of the drugs they are of uh, plant origin. So marijuana is a very famous uh, outdoor. So when the drug is uh, captured by the police at some place, they will they can study those uh, uh, drugs, marijuana particularly, and that marijuana must be having a lot of insects along with it. And by identifying those insects, we can know the origin of the drug. For example, a contraband marijuana is uh, caught, for example, in US. And when we study the insect fauna associated with marijuana, particularly beetles, we conclude that uh, these beetles they belong to Asia. They don't belong to uh, US. So you can easily say that this drug has come from Asia rather than having any local origin. And there are a number of cases where this type of uh, evidence was used. It was way, way back in 1986 that uh, cannabis was seized uh, in New Zealand and they could determine uh, on the basis of the entomological evidence the beetles present in uh, uh, cannabis that uh, it came from Highland and surrounding areas because uh, those beetles, they were picked up so, but after that, it remained almost neglected field. But in 2013, a very interesting case was observed, observed that they seized a truck 
marijuana, cannabis, and in that they found three species: bugs and uh, ants. And when we start identify those two species, then in figure A, you they have given the uh, the the distribution of species A in B. That in, uh, the distribution of anta and in C the distribution of cephalopod and in last figure we we put the figures over each other and then we determine which is the area which is common for the species. So on the basis of that we can determine that these uh, uh, three species they coexist in this particular area that has been darkened. And on the basis of it, we can determine that the drug has come from this area where all these three species they go. So, this technique is very interesting and it is uh, being used particularly with marijuana. A lot of cases, you can consult the teacher, a lot of cases you'll find that marijuana has. Uh, its place of region has been detected on the But the problem is that uh, we don't have the data. We have to create, we have to generate the data in order to apply forensic data. So this work we did it in our laboratory under the DST project, that how the bodies decay. So first of all, uh, because uh, you cannot uh, Allow the human body to decay. So most of the time, either it is the pig or rabbit that is used to decay. So uh, we studied rabbit. So you can see the fresh stage, the bloated stage, the decaying stage, and ultimately the dry stage. And we collected the fauna from all these different uh, uh, stages of decay. And on the basis of that, we form these tables that during summer season, these are the species that are available. During rainy season, during winter season, and during spring season, we'll be having different uh, type of insects that are available. For example, Lucilia illustris is available during summer, but it is not available during rest of the season. It is available during, uh, not available during rainy and winter months. Similarly, Chrysoma megaspella, it's available throughout the year. But Calipra of Sina is available only during winter and during spring. It is not available during rainy and the summer season. So in this way, we determine that which species are available during which seasons and which stages are formed during different days on day zero, what we found, day two and up to day twelve or day twenty-eight, when we found whether it's the cold season or uh, it's the hot season, uh, like for example, during summer it takes only 12 days for the body to decay, but during uh, the winter it takes 27 days. So this type of the data has to be created for all the areas. So this data is applicable to the job. This data is applicable to surrounding states, but it will not be applicable to the state of the or the hunt. So this type of data has to be generated for all the states. I'm happy that this type of data is being generated in the industry of the snow uh, for this area under, under the supervision of the federal. And the second is that you should have a graph showing uh, temperature versus density. How the life cycle of the fly is affected as a result of temperature. So this uh, what we did on California on this Krasomaya uh, Megasphala. We reared it at 10 degree, 15, 20, uh, 25, 30, and 35 degrees centigrade. And you can see how different stages they occur at different temperatures after different durations. This type of data in has to be available for all the species just from the species part of a puppy. Not long, 
people believe that uh, crow flies don't lay eggs at night, so they lay eggs during the daytime. It was day. till uh, it was probably in late eighties when Greenberg proved that uh, crow flies lay eggs at night. So this is very important because the, uh, our calculation will depend on the night whether they lay eggs at night or not. So when they approved that blowflies lay eggs at night, and when I was there, uh, somebody objected to that word, that you have proved that the blowflies don't uh, lay eggs at night. Actually, uh, you have proved that they don't fly. They may be crawling to nearby areas, and they may still lay eggs. So this experiment we did in our laboratory here at Patiala by placing the bait on the raised platform and we proved that night vegetation is possible even if uh, flies have to fly. They don't have uh, the bait nearby. They cannot crawl to the bait. So they fly at night and they do the at night. And this paper was published in International and a lot of changes have taken place in our calculation about the, the time since that because of this parameter that applies to the x. Whenever we have to draw any conclusion, we have first of all to collect the insect, the major stages, adults, eggs, they had to be preserved. And one aspect is that the species has to be identified. This is where our uh, practitioners are lacking, that correct identification has not been done, and that's why we are not getting good results from our analysis. And correct identification, generally, we go for correct identification on the basis of morphological features. Image stages, as well as adults, they are identified generally on the basis of their morphological features. Or if the morphological features are not helping us, then we can have molecular approach as well. So both these methods are good enough. So this work again I did with Greenberg in the University of Illinois that we can identify the eggs from glow flies with the help of their electron micrographs. All these species they can easily be identified from the microphone and this again comes in the morphological approach. All the eggs that we collected from different species, they were identified in these diagrams. Similarly, the amateur stages, the first instars we can identify, the second instars, and third instars we can identify on the amateur stages. I am mentioning here amateur stages because amateur stages are most commonly available on the dead body. Adults are there. We are more concerned about the role played by the images in the sense of Similarly, the pupil, they can be identified. The pupil shells can be identified on the basis of the structure of the posterior spiracles. The pupil, they have got different structures, different uh, types of spines available on the pupil, and you can identify them to the species level. Uh, this is the, a micrograph of uh, the surface of the PP of different species. You can see how the spines differ from each other, and we can identify the species of the, uh, the surface of the PP. Sometimes morphological methods fail. For example, they fail when the insect is damaged or incomplete. We can when we don't understand their full morph morphological features, then morphological methods may not be quite successful. Then keys are not always available. Particularly, we don't have keys for the amateur stages. That is why when we have to identify the amateur stages, we have to either to layer them to the adult stage and then identify the adults. Uh, most of the time, we cannot identify the uh, larval stage. Then uh, uh, 
it requires a lot of taxonomic knowledge to identify uh, the adult stages and uh, these are identification they are affected mostly by a particular stage uh, it may be for adults but on the other hand if we, we go for molecular approach the molecular approach will be applicable to all the stages if we can have data so dna techniques have been tried number of uh, then have been tried for the identification of species, but one that is quite common nowadays is the sequencing and sequencing particularly of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so we take the sample of the insect, extract the DNA, go for PCR, electrophoresis, purification, sequencing, and ultimately phylogenetic analysis. And here I'm showing that the mitochondrial DNA is easier to work with than the nuclear DNA for the number of reasons that the mitochondrial DNA is of mitochondrial inheritance. It has high mutation rate, high copy number. It doesn't have any introns. There is no recombination in mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so mitochondrial DNA is easier to work with because it is a smaller molecule. So most of the time, we are going for mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this work we did way back, over 20 years back. Uh, at that time, the softwares were not available. We did it manually. Nowadays, we have better softwares that you can easily identify the species by putting them into the software. But at that time, we had to do it manually and we could identify all the species that are on a particular segment of the mitochondrial So once we generated all that data, we wanted to check whether that data is applicable, whether that data helps us to uh, determine the post-mortem interval or that data is not Yes, and here uh, we studied real actual dead cases. This work was done by one of my students, Dr. Gert, he was doing MD intensive medicine, and we worked with dead bodies. And uh, here you can see, in 74% of cases, whatever we determined on the basis of negative evidence, it was the correct identification of the uh, time of death. In 11% of the cases, particularly in drowning cases, we could not do much. The data was not matching because we didn't have data for uh, insects or, or aquatic insects. We could not do much about it. And in 14.8% of the cases, our results were not matching. Maybe they are, that needed more investigations. But in 74.1% of the cases, we could time of the uh, data that I generated and on the list of the image stages of such data was available from the dead body. So after that, we tried to popularize it in newspapers. This was from Times of India, uh, again from Tribune, then from the vernacular newspapers. We tried to popularize this uh, subject that uh, entomology is helpful and uh, our, uh, our efforts have grown up, have been partially successful that our law enforcement agencies are now contacting us. Whenever they find some ecological evidence, they contact us to help whether we can help them in solving their particular case. So uh, this uh, article we published in Science Reporter was a uh, good magazine. It was published here, and the only case of that, we got good response from people from the police uh, agencies of different states that uh, if we can be helpful to them. So I have been going to different police agencies to uh, let them know how we can do that. Political agents, of course, it's not still very popular, but uh, people are getting more and more aware of So after that, I would like to discuss, uh, make the things clear, particularly for our students, 
on the basis of some cases which actually happen. So I think one case that is uh, a very classical case, whenever we talk about forensic anthropology, we talk about this case. So it is from 13th century, so 700 years back from China. So what happened is that a person was killed with the help of a sickle. Sickle is the, uh, the instrument that we use for cutting the crops. It has got each over it. So the person was killed. And uh, the people could not know who the murderer was. The village headman, he hit upon an idea. He asked all the main members of the village to come to his place with their sickles. And he asked them, to stand in a queue and put their stickers in front of everybody. And within minutes, flies started settling on one of the stickers because the person tried to clear that sticker, but the remnants of flesh, remnants of blood were there in the teeth of that sticker, which were attracted to the flies. The flies got attracted to that and they settled on that sticker, and that person had to confess. So most of the time, when we talk about the uh, this is a classical example that we gave. When I was in Greenberg's lab, BBC uh, made a documentary. The name of witness was a fly. So they they enacted this scene of 13th century China first of all, to show that uh, this science is very old. Of course, uh, uh, with the efforts of President Greenberg, it is getting more and more popular nowadays, but uh, it is not that uh, modern sense. Even in uh, 7th century back, people knew that flies will be but was fleshed. This was uh, a case in, uh, uh, in uh, USA. A girl was found dead in the forest. When her body was brought to the uh, hospital for uh, post-mortem interval, for uh, uh, determination, the cause of death for the post-mortem, the doctors observed that on her legs there were red dots. And when they scratched the red dots, they were actually small mites, which we call it. She says that mites were available attached to the dead body on her legs. So they reported it in the report that uh, her body was having these types of mites attached. When the police was investigating, they, they arrested one person. And when he was examined on his legs, same type of red sugars were attached. So those sugars, they were available in a particular forest where the body was found. They were not available anywhere else. So from that, they could conclude that the girl and the boy, that the person, were together in the forest where the sugars got attached to the legs of that girl and the sugars got attached to the legs of the murderer as well. So the, this is uh, just a simple case that the uh, occurrence of a particular species in a particular area can be helpful for determining the, uh, giving us an evidence in principle and knowledge. I was mentioning the root of movement or the displacement of the dead body. In this case, a person was killed. The murderers, they put his body in the trunk of the car and moved. On their way, they stopped to have breakfast. The car was standing out. They had their breakfast. Flies came in and laid eggs on that dead body in the trunk of the car. Then those people moved again and after two hours again stopped for having lunch. And at that place again, flies entered into a trunk of the car and they made them. The person, they moved the car further and threw the dead body at some place. So 
so when their body was found on the body they could find the immature stages of insects in a sequence that uh, body was placed uh, thrown at this d so there were immature stages of insects available at this d more developed stages of insects available at this d more developed stages more advanced stage of insects belong to this d and most advanced stage of development of insects available at this a so in this way they could trace the body was carried from this a to b from b to c and c to d so this how we uh, can determine the place of death as well as the route of movement of the dead body Uh, this was a case, very interesting case, where Greenberg was involved, and he told this story to me. Uh, in this case, a person, a boy, goes to the apartment of his girlfriend in the morning, opens the door, and sees that the lady is dead on the bed. He was stabbed. There was a lot of blood. So he called the police. That uh, uh, my girlfriend has been murdered because it was in Chicago suburb. So the police uh, they invited Greenberg also along with them. They let us go and see what happened. So when Greenberg went there, they saw that in the room the lady was there, dead on the bed with the blood. Windows were open, and when they saw outside, there was a lot of garbage around, and uh, Lot of flies were flying down, but there was no fly inside the room. Flies were there outside, windows were open, and there was no fly inside. He made the notes. Then the body was sent to determine the time of death, and the police, the, the, the doctors determined that the lady died last evening. So the body was there during night all around. Open windows. So Greenberg noted down that I don't believe this story because if the body was there with blood, throughout night, windows were open, flies are outside, but we could not find even a single fly inside. I don't believe this story. There is some lies. So they interrogated uh, the boyfriend, and ultimately he confessed. That he murdered the lady last evening, but the windows remain closed all night. He came in the morning, called the police, and just to show it as a case of robbery, he opened the windows, and the windows were open only for a few minutes, and flies from outside did not get much chance to get in. That is why the flies were inside. So here. Presence of the uh, absence of the flies where they should be present uh, came as an evidence. So it's not only the presence of flies; sometimes even the absence of can be an evidence. And this is uh, one case where such. Uh, this was again a very interesting case that uh, a lady she got uh, unconscious. Her son brought her to the hospital. She remained in the hospital for two days. After two days, uh, she got okay and she was uh, discharged from the hospital. Her son took her home, and next morning, he noticed that in her nose there were some maggots. Maggots were coming out of her nose. So he put a case in the court. That my mother was unconscious. The hospital people they didn't pro uh, take proper care of her, and flies laid eggs in her nose, and uh, uh, now we have got maggots. So it was a uh, case uh, where proper service was not provided. But the hospital people were saying that there is no chance that flies can. Enter our rooms because all the rooms have uh, wire meshes. So they engaged an entomologist. The entomologist he 
determined the age of those maggots which were collected from her room. And the maggots were four days old. That means maggots are four days old. The lady was brought to the hospital only two days back. So that means she already had an infection when she entered the hospital. That is why maggots are four days old. So in this way, the hospital was uh, rescued from paying a huge amount to the, to the person who was in it for their injection. So it's not a murder case. So because these maggots, these flies, they lay eggs on dead bodies, but sometimes they lay eggs on living organisms which we call as mice. So these flies, they cause mice as well as they cause the decay of the dead body. So with this, uh, I conclude and uh, thank you all once again for giving me this patient hearing. And I give to all of you a call that this is uh, a very fascinating subject. Of course, not very beautiful to see all the time. It's a very fascinating subject, and we should come forward to develop this subject and to less science so that uh, just like uh, the Western countries of the world, we can have scientific experience as a clean investigation. So that, uh, uh, entomologists are acting as special agents, even with FBI, uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, that is probably the best investigating agency of the world. Lord was there, he worked with FBI and he worked with a lot of cases of murder where he gave evidence and uh, we should help this man to that level that the such should be for solving in India as well. Uh, thank you very much once again and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my views and organizers in uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Devinder. Uh, it was such an informative lecture. I was following the YouTube feed and it is filled with questions and everybody is mentioning how much they're enjoying it. Because uh, especially in a country like India, uh, where forensic and uh, I would say entomology as itself is less understood and especially forensic entomology is an extremely less understood field. So uh, uh, it was I think it's really opened some eyes here. So there are uh, lots of questions. I'm going to put forth some. One of uh, many people, uh, let me mention some names. Shriza, uh, Bivas Kumar Malik, uh, Offa, uh, Mushtaq. These people have asked uh, one question which is more or less similar. That if the uh, person dies of uh, poisoning, or if they have, uh, say, too many drugs in their system, uh, how would it change the insect profile? And uh, how would uh, an entomologist deal with it? Would uh, would uh, it be as uh, would forensic entomology be effective also when uh, a person has died of poisoning? Of course, uh, if the person has died of poisoning. Uh, the poison will be affecting the life cycle of the flies. Uh, we did uh, some work on several poisons, and we have seen that the life cycle of flies is changed as a result of poisoning of uh, the person from which the maggots have been feeding. We did it with rabbits again. Uh, so these poisons, they change the duration, and we have to be careful that uh, if the life cycle is changed, that parameter has to be compensated. That uh, uh, if the poison was there, then we should take the data only with that poison, that how that poison is affecting the duration. Right, that it has to be done. And secondly, the cause of death, of course, that poison can be the cause of death, and that can be done with the examination of this fact. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Bali has asked, uh, what compounds other than, say, cadaverine and putrescine are responsible for attraction of flies to cadaver? 
uh, it is uh, the decay process when it starts. So first of all, a uh, lot of gases are produced. That is why the floating takes place. So those gases, they are attractive. Carbon dioxide is attractive for all the insects, for example. Right. Right. So a lot of uh, chemicals, they are released from the dead body. Uh, I don't uh, have to give a complete profile of right. all the chemicals, but those chemicals, they are affected by the flies and they will be reaching the dead body within a few minutes. That is right. that is the uh, uh, experimentally proved fact that they will find the dead body within a few minutes. All right, sir. Uh, sir, also, uh, is there, uh, Nichita Reddy and Bhaskaran, we have asked that is there any co association of uh, bacteria with insects in forensic sciences? Is, uh, do they, uh, you know, is there a, um, a complex of bacteria and insects which uh, uh, live together, or uh, can we study those complexes also, or are they individualistic in nature? Uh, as far as forensic anthropology is concerned, decay of the bodies is concerned. So I have not come across any reference where these bacteria are important from that angle. Of course, they are important from the angle of the degradation of the body. But from forensic point of view, uh, I have not come across much references where uh, bacteria are associated with the flies. So we are mainly concerned that the flies feed on flesh and they complete their development on the dead body. That is important for us from principle. Right, sir. Uh, sir, also one question by Satish Kumar, which is very interesting, is what will happen if a person was killed by burning? Is there any chance for the flies to lay eggs and breathe even in a burnt body? Yeah, there are a lot of studies done on burnt bodies. Uh, basically, the process uh, is almost the same. Actually, we have to have data about there are there are, for example, uh, cases of drowning, case mm. of burial, case mm. of burning. Every aspect, every situation has to be studied individually. We have to have data about the burned bodies. People worked on it. There are some references where they worked on. So there was a case uh, where they wrapped the dead body in in a blanket and then studied mm -hmm. it. It's a different aspect. So all these different types of variations, we have to take into consideration. It's very interesting that we have to take into consideration all these issues. Burial is one of them. One of my students, Dr. Madhubala, is working on dead body uh, under burial. So right. we can have uh, some type of culture evidence. In there. So burnt bodies, they do attract insects, but they are, they are a succession pattern will be changed and we have to study the part of uh, So many people are very interested in knowing uh, uh, how seasons and geographical locations. So we have Shubham Bhajan, Swati Siksena, Purva Shandalya, Arnav Shukla and many others were asking how seasons and uh, geographical areas will change uh, the uh, ecological succession of insects. And would uh, an insect profile be effective even if a body is found in snowy area? Actually, uh, I mentioned that uh, the flies, they are cupulothermic. So their life cycle depends on the temperature conditions and they are, they are, uh, they are, they are available to only during specific uh, temperature variations. For example, I mentioned about Califera vicina. Califera hmm. is a winter fly. It, it will not be available during the hot months. So the decay process that is taking place during hot months in a plane will be different from the same process taking place in a hilly area. Similarly, we have Lucilia illustris. So Lucilia illustris always is found during the summer months. So mm -hmm. it will not be found in, uh, uh, in, the, in the winter months. So we have to have the complete data which species are available in a particular area during which season. Season, mainly we are concerned about the temperature variation. When we talk about the season, which we are talking about the temperature variation. It doesn't matter uh, if uh, the temperature is high during March or the temperature is high during June, uh, during specific uh, years. 
so we have to correlate it with temperature but because generally we talk of season that is why i have taken this term otherwise i am more concerned for the environment in the other than temperature right sir um so uh, that is it has been an, uh, a very uh, uh, effective talk i'm sure because uh, i see many of the people in youtube youtube are actually surprised that insects can tell us so much because uh, we like to ignore insects quite a bit and uh, i think they've been very uh, impressed by how much insects can help us know about so much and uh, so how effective you've mentioned a lot of cases about uh, for uh, how uh, insects have been useful in international cases uh, yeah. because in india uh, forensic entomology is uh, as you said not such a big field right now do our uh, investigations take into account uh, forensic entomology or more uh, uh, or forensic biology is how important is that in our investigations Actually, as I mentioned, first of all, we didn't have the data about the right. really important things. Right. Even today, whatever we did, we did it for, for Punjab. It may be applicable to Haryana, parts of UP. It may be applicable to Lucknow. But that data will not be applicable to South India. That data will not be applicable to Jammu and Kashmir. Right. So first of all, we must have the complete data about the fauna that is available. And their distribution throughout the year, and their life stages, their life charts, life tables, we have to have. Uh, some uh, people they have used entomological evidence in the courts as well, but uh, uh, again, I'm sorry that they could not identify the species, and they used it as uh, uh, a random case that uh, it takes ten days for the fly to reach to uh, this stage. But without identifying the species, you cannot be specific that we did that day in this time. So we must have the data available. Only then right. we be able to fly. And secondly, awareness. Awareness about uh, this uh, evidence in our law enforcing agency has been made. We have been trying to uh, have refresher courses for our police that uh, because when. The police find a dead body. If there are maggots, first of all, what they will try to do just to clean it so that it looks good. Mm -hmm. So they are losing lot of lot of potentially useful evidence in that way. So that awareness has to be only then we can have this right, so. evidence. We can use it. And uh, as per uh, Indian Evidence Act, Article Forty Five says. Any scientific evidence can be used as an evidence in court if it is supported by an expert witness. So, under that category, that can be used in the court. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure uh, not only has the uh, uh, your lecture increased awareness, but I hope it has inspired. many of the people who were watching it to start uh, thinking on lines of forensic entomology or starting observing it and uh, creating and will uh, inspire them at least to create more awareness about this topic that is that is what thank you thank you so much sir thank for this you. extremely informative le lecture thank, thank, you. thank you thank you uh Uh, thank you to uh, everyone and special thanks to devinder sir we now have our next speaker who's joined us some time back uh, which is uh, dr mark uh, benick he is a german forensic biologist he is a freelance expert witness to, and has worked internationally on forensic cases uh, he works as a visiting professor at various universities and trains uh, police officers in forensic biology Uh, on the importance of forensic biology uh he especially and i think uh, the most uh, interesting thing is he has worked on the identification of adolf and eva hitler's skull and teeth and uh, he is the only forensic scientist who's worked on the very famous uh, colobed serial uh, serial killer and rapist case of louis garavito uh we are so delighted that mark could come and uh, agree to join us so uh, we had our fingers crossed and we were very nervous mark and we are so thankful you were here 
So I hand over the stage to you. Uh, please go on with your presentation. The screen is yours. Uh, you're not audible, Mark. Uh, you're still not audible. Some issue. First, you have to unmute. Unmute. No, he has unmuted, but even then. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Technology and its weird things. Are you joined to the computer audio? So Mark is uh, the best solution to any uh, technical problem is to log out, reboot, and restart. And uh, Mark in Germany has also opted for that option. I thought it was only for uh, us in India, shut down and restart. But it seems it is a universal rule. If nothing happens, we do that. So. Mark has just messaged us and said that he's logging out and getting in uh, again. Uh, technology keeps on uh, frustrating us and telling us, <laughs> uh, keeps us on our toes all the time. And he's joined again. And no, Mark cannot, still cannot. Uh, uh, have you joined with your laptop? Do you think you could try it on your phone? Yeah, maybe. Uh, that will clear whether the problem is with the phone or the laptop. Professor Singh, sir, I have one question uh, uh, for you till Mark joins. Yes, yeah, sure. Sir, how come India has not recognized uh, forensic entomology as an important tool in legal cases, in solving legal cases? Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, first of all, we don't have the data available. And secondly, there has been less awareness. Most of the time, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Most of the time, uh, the, the police they were not going for uh, scientific evidence. Let's talk about uh, insect evidence. So we were going for some other methods of uh, investigation. But nowadays, scientific evidence is the end thing. And uh, I don't think that they will be they is far off when uh, technology will be there as one of the methods. We have to be uh, generating awareness, particularly among the investigation agencies as well as among the judiciary. Only then it will be helpful. Otherwise, uh, if it can be used in all the countries in the world, why not in England? Yeah, Mark. Yes, Mark. Mark is it. Mark is it. Uh, Kalpana, can you unmute Mark and uh, see if it works? Uh, yeah. Mark, Mark has done it. Uh, yes, yes, Mark. Can you say something? Yes, yes. Can you hear Yes, me? We, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Great. 
Please, okay, the, go ahead. The, okay, hello, and uh, I'm very sorry for uh, this because I'm, I'm not using Google normally. Um, I um, The thing is now... I cannot present things on the phone, but um, I will turn the phone and maybe show you. And I hope you can see what I'm trying to show you. And then maybe we can have more questions and answers. And then um, I can uh, reply to things that may be of interest for everybody. So, uh, and first, and also congratulations to your 100th anniversary. <laughs> um, um, okay, um, I will. I will talk for maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes about um, what we do here very practically because uh, my um, excellent colleague just gave you a complete overview over everything. So um, maybe I'll just show you what we do. And um, one of the things, I'm, I'm, I'm trying this now. Wait, uh, this is probably a little bit complicated, but we will, we will work through. One of the things is it usually starts very let's see if this works well more or less um, it usually starts very easily for example this year is um, these are is an insect that was found in a real case so i was in the courtroom and my colleague from the federal bureau of investigation in germany the german bureau told me hey mark just have a look and tell me what happened because they think when you see a very bad copy, black and white trash copy like like this, um, you are like like a priest or, or a magician. And then you can tell the story. The reason is that this comes from the 1990s where people were watching um, CSI and, and, you know, all types of series. Now, this is, um, of course, a problem. But at the same time, I'm the expert witness in the in the court. So just to show you how sometimes if you are an entomologist, you can really do something is I said, can we have a break? And the judge said, OK, but 15 minutes, only 15 minutes. So I had one of my books with me and I looked at the very bad picture. But I saw that here you see a venation pattern. So here on the on the wing, you can see that there is a fork. And also you see very long antenna. The antennae here are, are very long. So I did not fully know what they wanted to know. But then I checked. And in one of our main books, this is a, a book written by a British colleague, Kenneth Smith. Um, you see that one of the insects here, this one, I made it blue. It has long antennae and has, I don't know if you can see it. It has a fork here. Yeah. yeah. So um, I checked what this insect is, and to my surprise, it is an insect that you often find uh, on the borders of forests. Now, when I came back from the break and I mentioned that this is an insect that lives on the border of forests, everybody was interested, which is normally not the case. Nobody likes crawling critters and boring biology. Biology is obviously very boring. So I was surprised, and they told me, um, that is interesting for the police because the police um, had a witness who saw somebody at the edge of a forest and and they know the time and the date. So this may be related because the insect that you saw was an insect from the corpse, but it's not an insect interested in corpses. It has no interest in corpses. So we were like, OK, maybe this is just an insect that shows us that the person who was there at the edge of the forest and was seen by a witness um, was um, wrapping the corpse in the forest and then dumping it. So now we have a connection between corpse, possible offender or person who brought the body there and time and date. And that, of course, is then interesting. I do not care um, what the judge makes out of that. But I'm very interested, of course, in the biological details. And as uh, my colleague just said, like in India, you can use any scientific evidence in the courtroom. And since this is scientific, because it's based on studies, that was then used. And they said, OK, Bineki, that's me, said um, this is relevant for the case, probably because it's an insect that is found only on edges of forests. Our pro probable offender was seen with his car and the number plate at the edge of the forest. Now the corpse is somewhere else. 
we have time, we have date, and so on. And then everything else is the work of the police. Now, I said, mm, I want to do some experiments because I prefer experiments. So um, we sent a student for one year <laughs> to the edge of a forest. He, he wanted to get his, his degree. So that's the experiment now. So that is our experiment here. And uh, we, we took... Um, That's the, that's the forest. It's a typical German middle European forest. And um, he built boxes like this by himself. He did it all by himself. That's him, Marcus. Um, he is now a biology teacher. He decided not to go into forensic entomology afterwards. And um, he, uh, we, we recorded time and date and uh, humidity, everything. Uh, temperature, of course, you heard that uh, from Devinda Zing, Zing before, and we did it very German. So record everything and, you know, do it German style. And then um, you see it's a lot of cabling, but still simple. We, we, if we can avoid it, we never use computers, but uh, we use something very, very solid if possible. And then we had our piglets. Um, these are the piglets and we put them in a trap. That is called, um, we call it in, uh, in Germany, we call it a malaise trap, uh, but everybody has a different name for it. So it's a trap where the insects can fly in through little holes and then they fly towards the light and then they are caught over here in, in the killing bottle. And then um, he recorded all the insects that were there. Of course, uh, he saw a lot of gr shiny green blowflies um, they are distributed worldwide, but they um, have different um, development patterns, of course. So you always have to check. And these flies deposit eggs, as many of you or all of you, of course, know. Then we have the problem that you already heard of from um, Professor Devinder Zink that sometimes they do not deposit eggs at night. But in uh, Europe... Everything is bright, day and night. There's light everywhere. So sometimes they fly at night. So you have to be careful. And then you get a maggot carpet. So these are the larvae and the maggots. And uh, skeletonization. Uh, you get beetles, you know. So these are uh, sometimes grave digger beetles. And on top of them in uh, Europe, we have a lot of mites. And the mites uh, are getting carried around by the beetles back and forth. And then everything dries out. And you get mummification. And now, now comes that what probably everybody thinks is boring. But you can't because you are, <laughs> you, you are zoologists and interested in forensic entomology. So I will show you. Um, by chance... We did not look for this. This We just had the super bad copy in the crime case and everything. But because we did the experiments, because of that, we got something new of which we did not think at all. And that was that you can distinguish the inside of the forest from the outside of the forest, from the edge of the forest, by the um, composition of species. You heard before, that some, let's say you have cannabis, like you heard before, then maybe an insect is attached to it that comes from a certain region. Now we go much, much smaller. We go to one forest and look at the differences only in this forest or on the border of the forest or outside. And what you can see is here that inside of the forest, you have a species composition. Let's, let's look, for example... Uh, let's take the yellow ones. That's Fania. Uh, it is called in Europe as a housefly, a small gray fly that enters houses and then circles around the lamps all the time. So there are different species. So the yellow one is Fania. And you can see that outside of the forest, you have much, much more Fania than inside of the forest. Now that alone does not help you if you have a body that is wrapped in a carpet, of course. But if you look at all the species, then you can do that. So if you look at the, um, how, how should I say, the spectrum or the all the different types of species, then it works. And that is a lot of work. Um, no normal person would, of course, do that. Only students <laughs> with our help. Um, because this is an experiment that lasts one year. And 
you have to work like 14 hours every day, 365 days. And um, he determined all of the species just for the zoologists. You can see many different types of Fania, um, Lucilia, which is a shiny green one, but then also very small ones, um, Hydrothea and uh, many others. I don't want to uh, bore you with that, but if you do this, then you have beautiful scientific evidence. Because if then in the courtroom somebody says, okay, how sure are you? Then I can say, well, totally sure. Because I was there, I did the experiment, you can repeat it, and you don't have to believe me. Nobody, nobody has to believe me anything. So that is um, one of the things that we do. We just do experiments. Um, it's a lot of work, like I said, and it would be impossible without the students or without somebody to do it. Uh, in other cases, we do it um, quickly. For example, when it comes to bloodstain patterns, but that's a different story. And then um, another uh, possibility, and then maybe if you want to, you can ask me questions. Um, we had a case where we had a lot of mummies in a basement in um, Italy. So usually when you see mummies in Europe, they look like this. They are just dried out. The skin is still present. Um, and usually we have a lot of Christians in Europe, of course. Then usually the, the Catholic Christians, they say this is a miracle from God. So the person was um, good. The Catholics think if you do not decompose, it is very good. And the other Christians, the, the Protestant Christians, they think if you do not decompose, it's bad. Then God does not like you. So it depends which Christian religion you, you belong to. So now we are going to Catholic Christians in Italy. So they think if you do not decompose, that is good. And, and they, had a, uh, they had a room. It's called a colatorio room. And inside of this room, you see there are a lot of skulls. And um, there, there is straw. And there is today is even plastic material. And it looks a little bit strange because we were lo looking for mummies. They have thousands of mummies there. And we do not see any mummies in the room where they work with the mummies or did work with the mummies for hundreds of years. You, you only see skulls and so on over here. So we thought, okay, that is a little bit strange. Maybe this is not really happening. Maybe... Um, they are not mummifying everything, but it's puppets. They are, they are more like, you know, making up a puppy theater. But I'm not like that because I work all over the world and I respect religions. So if you have a religious belief, then I'm not the one to tell you, no, science does not, you know, allow for a god or many gods. I'm not saying that. So again, we do experiments. So we look at the mummies that we see and um, because some mummies were there and they look like this. I just show you maybe two examples. So one of the mummies that was better preserved was one of this. The, it has a crown as, as you can maybe, maybe see there's a crown on here. It's considered in uh, Christians uh, that you are a virgin. Virgin means no matter how old you are, you can be 80 years old. Eight zero, very old, no problem. You can still be a virgin because you never had sexual intercourse. That's it. And um, in the basement, they have a special section for virgins, for example. So this is a virgin and she's good, well preserved. You see some mechanical damage, but that's only mechanical. And you see a little bit of uh, insects, but only a little bit. And that was strange because the basement and the room that you saw, it was all open. So no insects. You heard that from Professor Devinder Zink before. It's always strange when you do not see insects, even though there are insects. And also here you can see another mummy. And now you at the at the on the one hand you see mechanical damage. So there was water and fire and um, relatives touching this and soldiers in the Second World War were stealing the eyes because they were made out of glass. 
so what the soldiers uh, were taking souvenirs home so th these were glass eyes and but still we thought okay maybe there are insects but we just don't see them maybe the insects are hidden somewhere and uh, maybe we can learn something about how the corpses were preserved how long they were laying there you know like I said, we don't ask a specific question. We just look and do an experiment. So um, we did that. My colleague uh, Tina and I, she's behind the camera, but she's camera shy. And, <laughs> and um, so we went to the inside um, of the corpses. Here you can see that. That's me taking, uh, taking some material out of the very old uh, mummified corpses. Oh, wait, here. Um, one thing that is important is you need to have a scale. Um, I give out every single day. I hand out a lot of these scales. I made them myself to people. So they will always put a scale in the um, picture. Also, there's a color scale here. So you know which color it is. Because imagine this. I mean, what color is this? Is it brown? Is it gray? Is it yellow? So we put a color scale in and then also for people from English or American um, countries, we have inches here over here. Yellow and black is inches because, again, it is not allowed to use inches and feet, but people do it. So, you know, I'm not telling anybody how to do the sticker. It has millimeters, centimeters and inches and color. Um, in, I do this for um, 25 years now. I handed out at least 50,000 of these little cards to, to make people remember it doesn't work very well. Most people still put a finger in the picture to show the size or their cellular phone. <laughs> but okay, I tried. And since I practice what I preach, I use the, I use the scale here. And um, then we take out whatever we find. In many cases, it's difficult to see what it is because maybe many of you would think, is this really an insect or not? Very hard to tell. And I have to say, um, in the beginning, you often don't know. Um, we just published a paper on the topic. I will show you one picture from the microscopic pictures. So for those of you who are not um, interested in insects so much, um, even with 500 year old insect remains, I personally, I had a case that was 1,300 years old and the insects were still there. The remains of the insects were still there. And I just want to show you what it looks like under the microscope. So these are the original insects from the original mummies in Italy. So it looks like this. Sometimes you get a complete arachnoid. Um, um, so this is not an insect. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small a pseudoscorpion. Um, they they live in dust and very old libraries like mine. <laughs> they they eat dust in in libraries and so on. Um, then you can see uh, the head of a beetle here. That can be determined. You see a mite, which is also not an insect but a spider-like animal. And uh, you see much much more. You if you if you sort it all out, you see a complete beetle. Another complete beetle here. You see the legs of the animals very, very beautifully with all the um, hair or bristles. And here you see pupae. And again, this is after hundreds of years. You just have to do it. It's a lot of work. You have to work very, very slowly. Nobody can disturb you if possible. <laughs> it took us... Wait, one second. Tina, wann waren wir da? In Palermo. 2010 or so, ne? Yeah, it took us eight years. So we worked eight years on this case um, to, uh, to find out what was going on and to find out all the insects. So, okay, but the problem is now, how do we know that, um, let's say, 500 years ago or 300 years ago, what was the temperature? What was the situation? Which insects have been living there? And that is the good thing with religious cases. Because the religious people, they pre in, uh, at least in Europe, they preserve everything. Not in Japan or in other countries. They throw away everything. Tina is coming. Ah, yeah, for eight years. Yeah, eight years. So in, in uh, Catholic Christians, 
preserve everything so we can compare it. Even if you have a case that is 400 years old, we just go back and look for other cases from the time. But you cannot always do it. So I talked to a colleague in uh, Italy and I told her, her name is Teresa Bonacci. Hey, Teresa, do you have cases for me that are a little bit like mummification cases because you live in the same area? And she said, yeah, no problem. So I'll show you two examples. Um, this is a case where a body was not really mummified. Wait, one second. Uh, there, it is in a grave. I don't know if you can see it. It's in a grave. It's a hole in the ground. And uh, the flies that we found or that Teresa found were so-called forids. Um, they have a hunchback. So like, you know, like a huge, huge hunchback because it looks like a hunchback here. And these flies can only come if something is left. That means, again, no califorids, not the early inhabitants of corpses. Very strange. And um, another case, also from Italy, also from Teresa Bonacci, is this here. You see a man, very much like in the basement, in the, in the mummy basement that I talked about. He is mummified. And you see that in his eyes and in his mouth, like I told you before, uh, when we took it out of the very old corpses, you can now take out whatever is there. So Teresa did it. And the interesting thing is that when a corpse is just put somewhere in Italy without any special um, mummification techniques, they can even die from themselves. So it's not necessarily a homicide or anything or violence then you can still compare it to something. So A, we can do experiments by real cases. So the real cases are our experiments. Or we can compare it to other old cases. And again, you see, if you are a physicist uh, or um, let's say a chemist, you would say that's not an experiment. An experiment has to be done in the laboratory. But I mean, our corpses are anywhere in the forest, in a lake, in a basement, in a living room. So you can, the laboratory experiments are very, very good for, for growth rates and so on. But when it comes to the influences from the outside, you need a biologist because biologists, they like external influences. So that's what we do. And uh, the last thing I want to show you before you can uh, very gladly ask questions is um, I, I, I show it only in black and white. I have the color photos, but I only show you black and white because um, maybe people are looking on YouTube and um, this is published, so I can show it in black and white. So this is the child neglect case. Well, wait. Yeah. So we have a dead kid and when it was found, it had still the diapers on. Uh, and then my colleague said, okay, Mark, the problem is we don't have um, insects in the face. So like you heard many times now, no insects, that is strange because um, maybe they are just invisible. So maybe the window was closed or open. Maybe the door was closed or open or maybe somebody went in, in between and flies came in and then they closed the window or the door again. So we don't know that. And um, to our surprise, we found but to our luck, not for the kids, of course, but to our scientific luck, we found some animals in the genital region. This is a male kid. This is not a vagina. This is, um, this is a penis. And the little things that you probably can see here, these are larvae. In a normal autopsy, they would be washed away. Nobody collects them. Nobody. Somebody will take a shower, shower the corpse, and then that's it. And you will never know that there has been biological evidence. So these insects were interesting because they are not, in again, they are not interested in corpses, but they are interested in urine and feces. So we looked in, into the diagrams and the experiments and so on, and we saw um, how long it, um, the diaper was inhabited, not the corpse. We, we checked for the neglect time, the time of neglect, 
since when the diaper was not changed anymore. And some of the insects that you cannot see in the picture, or maybe maybe you can see them. I'll, I'll try to show you. Uh, ah, yeah, there is one. Some insects were in the face. Very few. Maybe you can see. Maybe you can see them. There are two here. One is here, and the other one is here. And these these larvae are interested in corpses. So we have corpse larvae that tell us how long has the kid been dead. And we have diaper insects interested in feces and urine. And these insects tell us how long the kid was neglected. And that was, and now you ask probably why is that interesting? I mean, uh, in the courtroom. Well, it became interesting because it was not the mother. The mother was a drug addict. So she was excused. So one said, okay, she was under the influence of drugs. Uh, she must go into a rehabilitation program and her, her guilt is diminished. And But how about the social workers? Are the social workers responsible or not? That was the big question. And all of a sudden, again, our biological evidence was very interesting because now it was decided in the first instance that the social worker was guilty because the time between neglect and death was meant a, a few days. So, so the judge said, okay, you had several days, so you have to rescue the child. And it took uh, the social worker, um, it took, it was a woman, uh, I think 10 years, she went through all the um, court, um, um, yeah, the, we have different heights of courts, you know, like a superior court, supreme court, lower courts, uh, until she was, um, uh, it was decided that it was not the fault of the social worker because a dead child does not make any noises. So the social worker was not allowed to enter with the police because she did not hear anything. She was there. She did not hear anything. So she said, OK, I do not hear anything. There's nobody there. I come back in a few days. And uh, then the su Supreme Court decided, OK, she cannot just smash open the door. She cannot call the police because when you don't hear anything, then that's uh, that's a different problem. But um, initially, it helped a lot to determine the time from neglect to real actual death. And that's the type of the cases we do. We do very, very um, nasty cases in the sense of that nobody's interested. Most of the time, it takes one person, one policeman, one policewoman, one um, person who is a relative, the sister, the brother, grandparents, these people come with the cases or a judge can, can also be the case. But usually it's one person and they just bypass everybody else and they say, I decided now you do the case. So um, that's how it works here. And uh, we do not have many routine cases because in those cases they say, ah, Homicide has a detection rate of uh, 98%. We don't need biologists for that. Or maybe we look at sperm or saliva, but uh, insects are not necessary. So what we do is we also try to bypass this and we just do our experiments. And if nobody's interested, then okay, bad luck for us. But you know, once in a year, <laughs> somebody finds it very interesting and then... Uh, we can do what we do. And since we all also have students and so on, um, every case is interesting because the students are always interested. So. so we are happy here in our laboratory. Yeah. And if you want to, you can ask questions now. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was uh, very, very uh, energetic and informative. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, that question, uh, that uh, 1300 year cases uh, you, you mentioned a 13 year old, 100 year old body in took you 8 years I mean that does definitely require a great level of fascination and dedication uh, to be able to stick to it and to solve it up uh, and, so also, and it also needs a lot uh, leads a good connection to people who are very different in the in the way they think for example, I always have to, uh, in the very old cases, you have to talk to the priests. And um, it is very good that I do not make any comments about religion ever, because 
everybody can believe what they want. And that is very, very um, good for us because they allow me to do cases that nobody else is allowed to do. Nobody, especially when it comes to uh, religious miracles. Usually I'm the only one they allow in because they know that I'm neutral and friendly. And also um, you need to talk to experts that do something completely different or to, they would never look at a corpse, never. For example, people who are experts for fabric, for fibers from fabric, uh -huh. we only know. We only know the criminalistic people, but the, most of them work in um, fabric production, in industrial mm. fabric production, and you need to know them and talk to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, before we move on to uh, specific questions that the audience is raising on forensic entomology, can you just tell us about that very interesting Eva and uh, Adolf Hitler's case? Uh, and, yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can do a, a special um, presentation in which I don't use the phone. Um, the the case was uh, very simple, really, in a sense, because nobody. Um, want, I think I think I was again the only one that want they wanted it to do because the Russian Secret Service was on it, the American Secret Service, and the British Secret Service. So um, that's not a good combination. <laughs> so. Um, I, <laughs> I was yeah, probably <laughs> I was yeah. probably the one uh, so uh, um, a movie team um, a documentary team from National Geographic asked me uh, if I wanted to do it and I was I thought yeah why not I mean I don't care I think the one of the reasons that I did it was I have a maybe you can hear that I have a very strong German accent so that sounds funny for for americans of course and for people <laughs> from england and so on so um i think that's funny when it comes to adolf hitler and so on but maybe they also knew that i have in germany i have a science show for 20 years now i do uh, science presentations every uh, saturday morning which is a weekend in, in germany so, i don't know so they took me to moscow and um the good thing was that we got supplied with um, x-ray copies of x-rays from when adolf hitler was still alive mm -hmm. because they tried to kill him with a bomb Ge also his own uh, people tried to kill him uh, the german uh, officers and they put a bomb and mm -hmm. at the moment where the bomb blew up adolf hitler was leaned over an oak table oak trees do you have oak trees in india yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. in the in the higher altitudes we do have. Yeah, okay. So so maybe you know they grow very very slowly and they are very very stable and rigid. So when mm -hmm. when he was leaning over the table, the blast could not reach him. So he was not hurt. Even though it was a real bomb and the bomb was working. So so the oak table saved him. But afterwards he had he had a lot of headaches. Um, in reality, the headaches were not from the bomb only, but also from stress. And he was a drug addict. He took a lot of amphetamines. So, so um, Hitler was completely drugged out on amphetamines. That's why he was so aggressive too. You know, when you hear him shout and, and scream all the time, that's that's from the amphetamines. And um, so he he felt very ill, also from other reasons. And then we got somebody made X-rays. And on the x-rays, by chance, you see that there was a lot of metal in his teeth, a lot of metal. And I can show you at another point. And this metal um, is dark in, the, in the, those x-rays, former x-rays. Even today, you can show it dark. And now I had the real teeth, the actual teeth in my hands. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very easy to compare the teeth to the x-ray when he was still alive. And the, then we could say, okay, these teeth are the real teeth because we have an X-ray from that time. So uh, Hitler, if he is still alive, he has no jaws anymore. All his jaws are gone. So it, he would be very easy recognizable without his jaws. And um, because some people think he's still alive, you know, it's a conspiracy thing. But at the same time, something interesting happened. And now we are back to the forensic entomology thing and to doing experiments all the time. I was like, wait a second. Um, maybe you make a wrong assumption. What if the X-rays are fake? What if somebody mm. faked the X-rays? 
because you know secret services you can never trust them never ever you know because they're secret service people so i'm like ah, okay so i spread the news a little bit in the scientific community also with a very friendly colleague um, in uh, switzerland who is also very interested in um, teeth of corpses he's a forensic odontologist and um, so we spread the news and all of a sudden i get a letter a real paper letter from somebody who claimed he had the original x-rays which cannot be faked so i make it very short like i said i can show you the uh, story at another point i now have the original x-rays and now I compared the original X-rays to the ones that I got from the Secret Service, and they are very identical. They are, they just have a very slight half a degree angle difference, and the reason is because they made uh, more than one X-ray. That's the only reason. And so our um, uh, yeah identification of Adolf Hitler or my identification was correct. But again, you see, don't trust yourself. I never trust myself, I never trust other people, I only trust experimental evidence or stains or something that can really be um, measured. If you cannot measure it, I'm not interested. Then I would just say, I don't know, sorry, I, I just don't know. Yeah. That is a very important thing as, as a biologist, I mean, as a scientist in general, it's very uh, important to de-link yourself from what is in front and to just trust the science of the whole thing and not let your opinions and your uh, preset notions affect it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll just get uh, to them. So I'm sure that some of them are very basic. So uh, no, no problem. Yeah. So uh, one of uh, my students has asked uh, that uh, uh, there are uh, so there were practitioners of mummifications across many cultures. So um, uh, many cultures across the globe have try, uh, have uh, indulged in mummification, and all of them have uh, different processes of uh, mummification. They use a different grade of chemicals and all. So uh, would uh, by uh, so would that change the insect succession or the kind of insects that you find in them? That is a very um, that is that is not as basic as it sounds, because uh, <laughs> because we looked at many many old. I uh, see. The good thing is that I have the cellular phone. I can show you more uh, stuff. Um, I I searched around concerning mummification, and I found a very very old book in Canada, um, because it's not available anymore on the free market. It's from a British man who just had the the money to bring over Egyptian mummies to um, England and he had like parties, you know, he unwrapped them. It was called unwrapping parties. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's only, I mean, that was, that was some time ago. So that's the history of Egyptian mummies here. You can see that. And um, yeah, I had to bind it because the, the, the paper was not even um, bound at that point. And um, he is collecting um, a lot of material also insects, which I find very interesting. Some of you maybe recognize these insects. So these are uh, dermistid beetles here. And um, so I had to go back a lot and uh, collect a lot of literature. It was very expensive and especially the customs were very nasty because it's very difficult to explain the customs, the value of a book or something. And um, there, there are uh, hand-drawn paintings in it and so on. So we, we worked a lot, Tina and I, my, my colleague and I, on these mummies. And what we found is that most of the time, the only thing that is relevant for the mummification itself is drying out. Just dry out the body and then you have a mummy. That's it. Okay. But um, you can use substances. For example, the richer people in, in uh, Egypt, they were using uh, substances, of course. And in those cases, it may happen that you have different uh, insects, but only for a short period of time. So in those cases, the insects tell you which method of mummification was used. It always ends with drying out, always. But the stages in between, they, the insects tell you the story about this. And uh, we were very surprised to see that. Um, for example, if somebody is very adipose, which was not uh, common in former times. 
um, you of course in India you know that, but also in Germany after the second after the Second World War, um, people were also very uh, slim, like me. <laughs> so um, so also in Germany pe people were were really slim, um, and um, so when you have a person that is more adipose and has more body fat, then a big problem in mummification is that the fat will become liquid and it can run out of the body. Maybe you have seen it uh, because it's in some regions of India, it's very warm. So maybe you see that normally in a thin person, you would have drying out. But if the person is adipose, they are not drying out. And that's because of the fat, the body mm -hmm. fat. And that is one thing that the insects tell you because the insects, most of them will not eat fat. So you have no, dry, no drying out, no fat. And um, if you see then a body in a very, I don't know if I can quickly uh, show you a picture of that, in a, in a very strange kind of um, decay, then maybe um, you have a case of mummification that went on slowly. Yeah, maybe, yeah, this is an example. It's not the best example, but maybe. Uh, maybe, it's maybe, nah, maybe you cannot see anything. You see here a, a woman, she was laying in her bed She has mm -hmm. long fingernails. Everything is dried out on her fingers. I don't know if you can see that she has gog uh, glasses on. And um, her face is relatively intact. But it looks like it's melted. It's mm. melted away. And uh, if you have a lot of substance melted away and then dried out, this is from an adipose person. So um, if in this case, they would have used preservatives like formalin, which is not drying out, then of mm. course everything would be preserved. But here they tried mummification and it did not look very good because the face now looks like in a horror movie. So, yeah. So insects can help you uh, to find out which method of mummification was used. Oh, excellent. Um, so uh, what I really wanted to ask you, and this is just, so uh, Professor Devinder before you was talking about how uh, in India, Uh, insect uh, forensic entomology as such or even forensic biology is not a very uh, common discipline that uh, homicidal uh, cases refer to to solve them uh, have you ever had any question uh, any interesting cases from south asia as such to sort of from south add, asia yeah yeah um, well it depends on how you define uh, the region but uh, I would, uh, I can give you an example from, I, I just take one example from a country from Asia and um, where maybe I can even show it to you. Um, that was, it has, that has had a lot of cultural, uh, cultural weight, so to speak, because it's one of the countries with a death penalty, um, because probably, you know, in, in uh, Europe, most countries don't, don't have a death penalty anymore. So, but this is a country with death penalty and, that is always very, you have to be very careful uh, because once a person is executed, of course, then you cannot say anymore, let's do some more experiments because then it's too late. And um, this was the case. From this, um, this is from Singapore. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, they sent me this photo here uh, because um, I was working in Singapore and the head of the Institute of uh, Legal Medicine, he remembered that, you know, that I like uh, for them in Singapore, they don't like dirt at all, chewing gum and, and uh, cigarette butts. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, no, it's a total no-go. Mm -hmm. And um, even insects. So they, they told me, okay, we, we, we dug, dug out a child. This is again a very small child and we found this. And these are um, pubic lice uh, or mm. lice, head lice, not, not pubic lice, head lice. So I was like, mm, that is strange because if you look at it, for those of you who are entomologists, you see immediately this is not a louse because it mm -hmm. has these, li these little feather-like structures. And so the problem is that in, um, in some countries, the oldest person, whatever the oldest person says, is correct. So, and I was younger. So we were like, oh, oh, oh. so I, now I cannot say that this is not a Laos because I'm younger. So this is not possible. So what do we do now? Uh, to, and it was a death penalty uh, thing. 
So I was like, okay, let's solve it um, with diplomacy. Um, we, so we, we, uh, we told them, okay, there are two types of pubic lies, uh, of lies. Um, there are the long lies, at least in Germany, I don't know, or in Europe. So these are the long ones. And the long ones, they live on hair, if you have hair. So if I had hair, then they would live on my head. And the other type of louse does not live on hair. And that type of louse lives on pubic, also, or not on head hair, it lives on pubic hair. So why is that important? It is important because the um, district attorney's office, the, 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 uh, those who accused uh, or were, were work, working for the DA's office, they said, since we found a louse, this one, we know that the child that is now dead must have been alive because head lice only live on living human beings. Mm. Mm. Now, now that is correct. So yeah. if the, and their logic was, if the child was alive and now it's dead, then the mother has, must have killed it and buried it in a shallow grave. So now we use diplomacy because we could not say this is not a Laos. This was culturally not acceptable. So we said, okay, let's say it is a Laos, but we are not sure if this is probably not a pubic hair Laos. Now, if these are pubic hair lice, then they could have been transferred to a dead kid that was born dead from the pubic hair of the mother to mm -hmm. the child. Mm -hmm. And then we do not have to have to assume that the child was alive. And that was our diplomatic statement here. So that was a case from um, Asia with a little bit of cultural um, yeah, background in it. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, Kalpana, you have some questions? Uh, Mark, I would like to ask uh, about any interesting cases uh, where you had much difficulty with the law uh, and getting uh, through the law uh, to get the punishment for the culprit or any, like, anything like that. Did you get my question? Uh, no, you, you mean a case that made it to the courtroom or? Yes, yes. No. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Kalpana there... just put it here. She, she's, uh, Kalpana is asking that uh, was there any case where uh, the uh, you had evidence but the law would not agree to it? Uh, or you had <laughs> difficult convincing it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, usually that does not happen a lot because um, the in Germany, it, um, the expert witness statement is of no relevance. The, the, you just deliver it. It is a piece of evidence maybe, or it's a statement, but that's it. So in Germany, only the judge, exclusively the judge, nobody else decides if it is evidence or not. So we, d we don't have the problem really, because it, for me, there's, there are only two things. I present in the court, or I do not present in the court. So that's it. it um, in many cases, they decide not to use it, but that's not a problem for me. Because, um, for I give you an example. Okay, I can show you a case. Wait, I'll show you. Uh, in, uh, I don't know if you have them. Um, we call them uh, cheese skipper flies. These are these are flies. They can um, put their front end to the to the hint end, and then they jump. Um, I, I don't think you have um, you you like you like that regionally, but in um, in southern Europe, this cheese very very stinky old cheese and people like it, and the cheese flies fly to it. So this is what they look like: black flies, cheese larvae, and these are the larvae. And then they can um, attach the front to the hint end, and then they jump. So we had a case where we. Um, the body was in a very bad state, maybe a suicide in a, on a train, maybe a homicide, and it looked like this. We, we cut open the bones, and then in the bones, we saw cheese skipper flies inside of the bone. The bone was not damaged. We, we cut it open. It was perfectly intact. A skeleton, beautiful skeleton, with a cheese-like... Oops. With a lot of uh, cheese-like attachments. Do you hear that? Okay. And um, so we said, okay, how how do the cheese skipper larvae come inside of the bone, 
even though the bone was not um, damaged at all. What does it mean? And that is a case where we wrote an expert witness statement. I, I wrote an expert witness statement. And then people said, yeah, but we have we know what happened. Have a nice day. So I would not say that um, they decided not to use it in the courtroom or dismiss the evidence. It's just that they had some other information for typically, for example, it's a suicide. Forget it. We are not interested. We are homicide detectives. We are not interested in, in uh, suicide cases. So, um, but still, but, but still, we um, we uh, we deliver our expert witness statement, and for us, it's just a scientific thing always. So, it was not used for anything later, but the police took it and was interested, and that happens regular uh, that happens a lot because um, we try to come in early or very late that happens also when everything already happened and then we work after the case happened and in those cases of course the the um, court proceedings already took place and then um, the case is reworked and reopened so very often we are somewhere with our evidence and we are just happy that we can deliver it to anybody Okay, and one more thing I would like to ask, are the laws more favorable in Europe for admitting biological evidences? It's, um, it's not, yeah, no, it's no problem. It's like Professor Zings just said uh, before, you can use everything in uh, also uh, in the United States um, and uh, in other countries that, that have thought, thought about the problem that follows certain scientific rules that means a the expert must prove if he is asked that he's an expert for this for um, i personally for example um, this is not a requirement i am in germany the only one who is officially certified and sworn in for biological evidence and some more and I'm also somebody who is uh, uh, who is a judge, no, not a judge, uh, who is like a teacher for, for other expert witnesses. So that is one thing that is not required, but that is good if you are officially certified and sworn in. Then the next thing is um, the science itself must, must be scientific. So it means it must be reproducible. It must be on the state of the art. So you cannot use data that are 25 years old and if you use data that is 25 years old then you must explain why which is difficult because in most cases you would say well i don't have anything else my growth curves are 25 years old but that's probably not always the best um, answer and uh, the third thing is it must um, it most other scientists in your field must uh, use the same techniques so you you cannot use outsider techniques and as long as you have these three or four four things you can you can use any biological evidence no problem any other interesting case that you would like to uh, uh, tell us that you enjoyed doing that or <laughs> was excited yeah, we, have, we have many cases um, wait let me see maybe um, um, yeah, maybe. Ah, uh, yeah. That is uh, that is maybe also interesting for uh, also for students. If you want to make the students be interested yeah. and and yes. Yes. Uh, continue to work. So um, this is with our German Federal Bureau of Investigations, mm -hmm. and they have a crime scene unit, but they they are not too much into insects. So they told me, okay, Mark, uh, maybe you can just show us how to collect the insects. And then we can give it to the biologist. I said, yeah, no problem. So here you can see that. So that is uh, one of these cases. These, these, this is the crime scene team from the Federal Bureau uh, of Investigation in Germany. And that's me there. Um, here you can see I have, I have special uh, uh, clothing for tropical countries. So that for outside um, things, I don't, I don't use what other people use. I use uh, specialized uh, tropical clothing. And then there's a dead cat here. You can see there's a dead cat. 
So we are putting animals out and then um, we do experiments and just show them which insects are there. So um, I go to sleep. Now, again, you see this repeats itself. I, I never stop. I always continue to... Do you hear the, the microphone? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. But that's not for me. So, um, so I go to sleep and um, it, it itches. And normally nobody would take care. I mean, it's like, okay, it itches. What's the problem? So here you can see this is my foot at night. You can see the cramp seed sticker. Mm -hmm. Always, always use the cramp seed sticker. Mm -hmm. And you see red, red dots here. Mm -hmm. the... Is everything okay? Uh, yes, there's, yes. A lot, there's a lot of noise in the line. Do you hear that? Do you hear uh, me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay, okay. Huh. And um, so what is unusual here with the little red dots here, 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 here. What is unusual is usually we have um, mosquitoes, normal, normal mosquitoes, but they do not uh, um, sting exactly there. It's a, it's a little bit of an unusual location. So usually when they sting, they sting here where you have uh, the veins directly under the skin. So everybody else probably would continue to sleep. So I was like, eh, eh, eh. let's let's have a look. So I went, I undressed naked and put um, put a marker pen like this and marked all my all the dots on my body because it was not only on the foot. I will show you the picture, but without me being nude. So don't worry, no problem. It's, ju it's just a drawing. So that's me. And you can see the, the, the foot is gone now here. But you see there is a kind of, um, it's a clustering here. And um, I'll show it to you again. And maybe, maybe you, can, you can think if you see the clustering. So this would be the genital area, which I did not show. And here, this is the navel. Of course, these are the hands. These are the knees. And I was like, wait a second. That is unusual. Why do I have the, whatever it is, not mosquitoes. Why do I have them on, on my feet? And then not on my legs, you, you remember, no insects, strange. And then back again where my underpants are. So they're all in the area of my underpants. And um, so I was like, what's going on? I did not see anything, just the itchy dots. And so I was like, mm, okay. And then a real case came up in the United States, not my case. It was a case from colleagues. So that is me. And that is the real case. And you can see again the clustering. So there, just where the in the in the, on the back side of the knees, you see the whatever it is, insects, mites, and then you see it up here again where the where the underpants are, and a little bit above. And this is the exact location. So my dots are the exact dots, and the other dots are also the exact dots. It's not like it looked like this, but it looked exactly like this. It's just I don't want to show you the photos. So um, the team in the United States, they were like, okay, let's do experiments. So they took students and told the students, if you want to work on a real case, you can do it. Who wants to do a real case? And then, of course, everybody said, yeah. <laughs> which is always good because then they cannot go back. And then they were sent to the place where a dead woman was found. And the man that you saw here, this man here, this is the person who was last seen with the dead woman. And he was known to be a violent offender. But he said, I have nothing to do with it. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, um, the, the patterning of the on his body because he was um, he was photographed uh, naked. The patterning was interesting because A, you see the patterning, but B, it was also itchy. I mean, not everything itches. So the students went out to the forest and when they came back, they did not know that, the colleagues were looking for, for the itchy red dots. So that was the true purpose of the students here. They were just bait for the insects or mites that were close to the dead or had been close to the dead woman. And uh, this pattern was then used because it is a pattern that you, you can see it worldwide. Um, it's from mites, not insects, but mites. So eight legs, very small, and they crawl up your hair. 
on your legs, for example. And then they, they like the region of the underpants because it's warm there and sweaty. And they like the feet because maybe you don't like that. Many people in Germany, especially females, don't like it. Um, but I have socks in my sandals. People hate it, but okay, I do that. So the, the animals liked it inside of the socks and in the underpants. And the same happened here. So exactly the same happened here. Now, what, what, how does it help us? Okay, it helps because A, and that was used in the court. He has a life sentence. He will never get out of prison again. Um, a, the, um, the mites live there and usually they do not bite humans. They go on, you know, foxes or whatever is running around, wolves, whatever you have there, boars. But here, it is a region where they jump on human beings. That is not so often. That you don't see not that often. So now you have a possible regional connection, like with the edge of the forest. Now, and B, he was last seen with the woman. Now the question is, when was the man probably there? And that was the interesting thing, because now you have to measure the size of the allergic or of the reaction to the bite. So that is something that you can very easily do. Just measure which types of bites you have. This here is from a simulite. simulite. Do, you, do you have simulites in uh, India? Probably, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So, so this is from a, from a, a simulite and um, it produces a completely different bite pattern and also a completely different reaction. So you can send out students all year with a crime scene sticker and then uh, they get all types of different bites and then you collect how the different um, bites swell and unswell. This is different for every person, of course, as you know, from mosquito bites and from uh, bee stings and wasp stings and so on. But at least you, 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 you get your hands on the case. So um, that was a case that was uh, not done by me, but I did something completely similar without knowing it. And it gives you um, the possibility to determine location, possible location, possible time due to the swelling. And also, it's more interesting for the police to find out if the person who was last seen is a possible offender or not. Because, I mean, many people can be last seen, but then afterwards something happens to the, to the person. So you never know. And in this case... Um, It was interesting for the police and it was interesting for the court. And taking everything together, he got a life sentence, not based on the biological evidence alone, but based on the complete uh, evidence. And that is maybe a case that shows you that you can always send out students to help, even if there's no case. You can tell them, check the edge of a forest, check the insects on corpses, um, find out what the stings look like on the offender, not on the dead person, what the mm -hmm. stings look like. So it's, uh, it motivates the students a lot, such cases. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. It's been uh, so interesting, I mean, uh, to hear about actual cases and uh, to know how the biological evidence helped uh, break the uh, deadlock and to give a new insight into it. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you. I mean... Uh, I'm not a forensic entomologist, but you got me so excited about it. I'm an entomologist. I do feel, I always tell the students uh, when I talk about insects as to uh, how many roles they fulfill. And I always say that they're detectives. They're actually Sherlock Holmes in disguise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's so, true. Or, I, or sometimes I call them silent assistants. You know, they're, ah, they're helping us and they're just yeah. quiet silent assistants. Yeah. I, I like that one. I'm going to use that <laughs> when I saw... So, um, it's really got us excited and I hope that everybody who's hearing that uh, now starts uh, looking at, uh, you know, insects in a different way. And uh, we normally make a, a bad face when we are crossing a dead animal which is infected with insects and maggots. Maybe now we can stop and try thinking about what it is, when did it die? Yeah, I, I, I sure hope you can, we can do that instead of, you know, uh, scrunching up our nose and just walking off. I hope we can now stop and look and uh, I am, uh, I, I, with the help of Kalpana who's in, who does forensic entomology, who started with it and has uh, two theses submitted with her, awarded with her. I hope uh, that we can introduce this 
for our entomology students and of course Devinder Singh sir will uh, definitely I'm sure help us with uh, helping us do that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank I, you, I Professor Devinder. Yeah. I have one final idea. If you yeah, want to, please. I can I can also stop by one day and we can put out some corpses. I mean, animal corpses, because last time we found a new species, new to science. Oh. So so if you want to, uh, we can stop by, collect a lot of insects. And then we do some special determination and maybe we, we find even a new insect. If you Absolutely. want to. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, what can be better than that? Right, Kalpana? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, and, uh, thank you so much, Mark. I hope we all stay in touch and yes, uh, we yes, do look pleasure. forward to taking your expertise into account whenever we need. Kalpa, you were saying something? Yes, I, uh, you call them silent uh, silent assistants. I call them wriggling witnesses. She calls them wriggling witnesses, yeah. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be wrapping yeah. up the session uh, for today. And uh, I hope all the viewers will join us again. We'll have more numbers, more excited people coming tomorrow for this thing. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank Cheers you. from Europe. Have yeah. a nice day in India. <laughs> you too. Uh, thank you, Professor Devinder. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye, everyone. And we hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>